Hello! <coughs> Welcome to an adventure. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I think I got things working today. Um, but my normal, like, help setting up was not available today, so I had to do it myself, and I don't have instructions on how to do it, and I never do it, so I didn't really know if I did it right. But hopefully you can hear me and see me, and we're going to have a stream. So, Mike is a bit hot. Um, I think I can adjust that. Give me one second. Uh, I'm just going to walk over here, and... Let's turn that down just a bit. Uh, is that better? Hopefully you can tell me. Um, and I'm going to just adjust this down just a tad bit too. I hope that this is better. Um, let me know. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and do the acknowledgments. Um, so, uh, welcome to Archival Adventures. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Um, I do want to acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live, and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. I want to pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation, and at any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, I want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So, thank you for uh, that. Hello! Hi, Librarian Liz! Hi, Hannah! Uh, also, hello, 16-Bit Eric. Thank you uh, for bringing over the whimsies. We're getting a raid over on the Rogan27 channel. Um, for everybody who's arriving, welcome raiders, wake, welcome whimsies. Um, <laughs> welcome to a show that I call Archival Adventures. Um, I am Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Uh, some of you on the internet may know me as Rogan27. Um, and this is a show I do every Wednesday from about 2.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time where we look at materials from the archives here at Virginia Tech. So that is the plan for the show today. Um, uh, I'm a little, a little distracted today uh, because my normal like help setting up wasn't here today and I had to try and get the sound working. I think I got everything up and running. Um, microphone is producing noises, uh, video is transmitting, you should have the piano as well. Um, the only thing I couldn't figure out was how they were splitting the sound so that you could hear it and I could hear it, so I have no audio monitor, so if the, if the pretzel songs get really out of whack, I won't know. <laughs> so do let me know if it starts playing some really weird music that just doesn't seem to fit. It's supposed to be chill piano. Anyway, um, I'm going to say hello to all the Raiders. 16-Bit Eric, thank you so much for bringing everybody by. Uh, it's always great to have the whimsy stop by. Uh, Picado, welcome. Adventures of Tony, welcome. Uh, Chandra, hello, hello. Lord Portico, Librarian Liz. Um, yeah, okay. So everybody else who, j who joined on the raid, and whether you're in chat or not, it is always great to have you here. So the focus this week um, is folk medicine, home remedies, and patent medicines. Uh, so I pulled a number of things from our collections that we're going to take a look at. And we're just kind of going to explore and see what uh, what one of these books refers to as nostrums and quackery. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Tater Thought. <laughs> um, so 
uh, we're go we're going to explore these things. Uh, some of them are from our manuscript collections, and I have a description of them. Some of them are from the rare books collection. Um, all of them are going to be rather interesting, and I think it may take more than one week to look at them. So we may be doing this again next week. If not, I'm not sure what we're doing next week because I haven't had a chance to look yet. But let me go ahead and flip us over um, to the document camera, I think, first. Yes, okay. <laughs> You're here for the quackery representation. <laughs> um, so let's see, this one that I have here, this is from the culinary pamphlet collection. Sorry, I got my finger in the video there. Um, and so this folder from the, the pamphlet collection, let me autofocus that camera, um, is from the Lydia E. Pinkham Medicine Company. Um, I don't know, let me see what I got, what I got. I don't know how much description is in our finding aid for the specific things within the collection. Um, <laughs> sorry, I could show you what I'm doing, uh, which is I'm trying to find the finding aid for this collection and I did not do a good job of it. So give me one second and let me find it. MS 2011-002. It is not the Sherwin, Sherwood Anderson photograph postcard. It is not the Farrell letters. Agricultural ephemera, Nas National Biscuit Company. Where is my... Culinary ephemera, ephemera, nope, that's not it. Eventually, I will find this. Um, surprisingly, not on the first page of results. Let me try searching with the actual name of the collection instead. Um, pamphlet collection. There we go. Uh, we still have a little bit of duplication in here. This is a site called Virginia Heritage. It's where our finding aids are housed for uh, the tools that actually help you to find things in our collections. Um, the culinary pamphlet collection, oh, because I have it zoomed in size, it's a little bit strangely formatted here. Let me scroll down a bit. Um, I wanna find specifically Pinkham. Lydia E. Pinkham Medicine Company. So not really any basic information about the company in here, which isn't terribly surprising. Um, we would describe the collection as a whole, but not the specific things. So I'm just gonna do a quick Google search so we can learn about this company. Lydia E. Pinkham Medicine Company. And then we'll take a look at the, this, there's actual like booklets in here. Um, Lydia Estes Pinkham was an American inventor and marketer of an herbal alcoholic women's tonic for menstrual and menopausal symptoms, which medicinal experts dismissed as a quack remedy, but which is still on sale today in a modified form. Interesting, okay. So let's take a look at these books. Uh, if anybody else wants to research a little bit further about the company or about Lydia herself, um, feel free to do so. And um, anything you find, go ahead and drop in the chat and I'm happy to, to share that information. Um, there's still a company using the Lydia Pinkham name, Lydia Pinkham Herbal Compound. So inside the folder, we have a number of these little booklets. Um, and so this culinary pamphlet collection is, is a much, much larger collection where we have 
pamphlets from various different culinary companies um, and a lot of older medicines and like tonics and home remedies and things like that kind of fall under that because um, if you look at old recipe books, which we will later today, um, they have recipes for foods and recipes for things that were supposed to be medicinal, um, kind of mixed together there. Um, so let's see, we have stretching your dollar. Oh dear. When your daughter comes to womanhood. Most girls in their teens, okay, so I'm just gonna preface this by saying um, the dates on this are going to be not modern. <clears throat> I, d I have not looked at them before. I don't know what they say. Um, and it sounds like for this folder especially, we're going to be talking about menstruation. So just going to kind of put that out there. <laughs> uh, Lord Portico, uh, this is... Um, not really super creepy product placement, considering that this is the product that this company sold. <laughs> so, we're, we're not specifically looking at food things today, Lord Portico. We're looking at medicine and um, early medicine, to be precise. So, most girls in their teens need a tonic and regulator. Give your daughter Lydia E. Pinkham's vegetable compound for the next few months. Teach her how to guard her health at this critical time. When she is happy, healthy, when she is a happy, healthy wife and mother, she will thank you. Words cannot describe what Lydia E. Pinkham's vegetable compound has done for me. I suffered for years from pain and irregularities. My grandmother advised mother to get the vegetable compound for me. I took three large bottles and it regulated and strengthened me. A girlfriend of mine had the same trouble. I told her about the vegetable compound and it has helped her wonderfully. Frida M. Hannum, Shady Lane, Periopolis, Pennsylvania. Lydia e, Lydia e. Pinkham's Vegetable Compound, endorsed by half a million American women. <laughs> yeah, new month. <laughs> As Hippocrates said, let your food be your medicine and let your medicine be your food. Okay, a according to a site I found, the original vegetable compound contained black cohosh, life root, unicorn root, pleurisy root, and fenugreek seed, plus 20% alcohol. That is, I don't even know what all of those are. I have no idea what cohosh is. I don't know what life root is. I don't know what unicorn, unicorn root is. I've heard of pleurisy root, but I don't know what it is. So really the only ingredients that I know what are are fenugreek seed and alcohol. So, This is really interesting because this this entire thing is going to essentially be to sell their product. So what else is in here, I wonder? A year ago, I didn't care what became of me. I was so nervous and blue and suffered so from backaches. A friend of mine recommended Lydia E. Pinkham's Vegetable Compound. I have taken seven bottles now and I feel better than I ever did. Mrs. W.C. Mead, 135 Main Street, West Orange, New Jersey. Yeah, old school commercially. So the, technically, um, I, I believe commercially available medications would fall under patent medicines as far as a classification between home remedies, folk medicines, et cetera. I believe if they were commercially available um, that they fall under the category of patent medicines. Um, I was badly run down. Wear it out. Buy two or three pairs of silk stockings at a time, the same shade. When they begin to wear out, discard the worst ones and pair up the best ones. Try this with children's stockings. 
When your sheet wears thin in the middle, split it and sew the outer edges together. Of course, this brings a flat seam in the middle, but it makes the sheet last a few months longer. Pillow slips for everyday use may be made from old sheets and face cloths from old Turkish towels. Do not neglect the possibilities of dyes. They are reasonable in price, simple to use, and come in a bewildering variety of colors. Many a faded, half-worn garment can be restored to usefulness by a change of color. Uh, Pakadal, if you want to, um, if you want to look into information about those herbs, I'm happy to get that information. Um, it's relevant to what we're looking at this week. So if you want to do the research, um, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so much alcohol. It was the only way to get alcohol in dry counties during the Victorian era. That makes actually a lot of, a lot of sense. The Embryo Project Encyclopedia had an article on their site about her compound. So it looks like there's, there's lots of ads for the Pinkham Company's products, but also this, this one is all about like tips for stretching your dollar. So that one about the, the, um, taking worn out sheets and turning them into pillowcases. Um, this one about making the most of your clothes alliance, or clothes alliance, uh, allowance. Uh, there's some recipes in here. So it's mostly about selling their products, but it's also providing some potentially useful information for women, which was their target audience. And we have a number of these, and I don't want to spend the entire time looking at them, but we will look, uh, I'll flip through a few more. Um, let's see. Favorite recipes, save time and money. Um, Lambert US, uh, so the range of topics that I cover on Archival Adventures really depends on what I find in our collections. So all of the materials that I feature on this show are from the Special Collections and University Archives at Virginia Tech. Um, and we have, uh, we have materials on the history of science and technology, we have uh, the history of food and drink, the history of the American cocktail. Um, we have uh, stuff about um, women in, in the built environment, so particularly women architects. Um, uh, also, university history for Virginia Tech. Um, history of the Civil War, the American Civil War. Uh, so we have a, a number of topical areas that we collect in, and so I share materials uh, from our collections. So uh, last month we did uh, some stuff from the History of Food and Drink collection that was all focused on kind of the history of backyard grilling and outdoor cooking. Um, and today we're looking at uh, some stuff that we have, again, from the History of Food and Drink collection on herbal remedies, folk medicines, patent medicines, etc. Oh, and thank you for the follow. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chandra. Um, I'm, I'm clicking on this link here. Lydia Pinkham's Vegetable Compound, 1873 to 1906, first marketed in the, in the U.S. 1875. Lydia Pinkham's Vegetable Compound was an herbal medicine used by women to relieve menstrual discomfort and menopausal symptoms in women. Invented by Lydia Estes Pinkham in 1873 in her home kitchen in Lynn, Massachusetts. It's alcohol mixed with roots and herbs. It was patented, packaged, and distributed by the Mrs. Lydia Pinkham Medicine Company in 1876. Advertised in many U.S. newspapers and magazines. Uh, it became a household name. And... According to this, made treatments for female reproductive discomfort, discomfort mainstream in the U.S. Let's 
So we've got a number of, again, so this one is saying that it wants to mainly be focused on recipes. So we've got like brand muffins and date muffins. Um, <laughs> Do your nerves get the best of you? Jumpy nerves yield to the soothing action of this medicine. You will eat better, sleep better, feel better, look better. Life will seem worth living again. Don't delay any longer. Begin taking it today. Lydia E. Pinkham's Vegetable Compound. I feel 100% better. Once I was in a terrible stage, I suffered with headaches. My back bothered and I couldn't sleep. I was nervous and run down. I read about Lydia E. Pinkham's Vegetable Compound and I tried it. Now I sleep better, eat better, and my nerves are much better. Mrs. Agnes Phillips, 217 Hayward Street, Brooklyn, New York. For jumpy nerves. Before my second baby came, Lydia E. Pinkham's Vegetable Compound made me strong. It relieves headache, backache, and irritability. My nerves were jumpy, but now I can do all my work and feel happy. I recommend your medicine to all women, especially at pregnancy. Mrs. Milton Stevens, Route Number 3, Goodwater, Alabama. A medicine which helps so many other women must be good. Let it help you too. Get a bottle from your druggist today. <laughs> I kind of love old ads. They're, they're shameless about being ads. Um, they're very clear in, in selling things. Um, and they, honestly, I find them really entertaining. Do you know as much as your cat? She's a knowing cat. She asks for little, just her meals, a saucer of milk and a place in the sun. She gets plenty of sleep and exercise. She never worries, never frets. What is the result? Such vitality and resistance that we say cats have nine lives. What does your cat do when she is not well? She eats catnip. If she can find it, she eats grass and certain green plants to which her instinct leads her. Your cat takes herbs for a tonic. Do you ever stop to think that old mother nature who supplies the herbs necessary to your cat's health has also provided the herbs necessary to your own well-being? You don't, you don't have to hunt for them as the cat does. The herbs you need are skillfully blended and compounded in Lydia E. Pinkham's Vegetable Compound, an old-fashioned tonic that will help you restore your strength and energy. Lydia E. Pinkham's Vegetable Compound, used by women for more than 60 years. <laughs> I did not know that, Chandra, that you collect old Victorian uh, recipes. We're, we're going to have some things you might find interesting today, then. So I'm just going to show off a couple more of these covers. The, the insides are all going to be basically the same. We've got practical cooking recipes, hints for food and health. These are all booklets that are like self-help books uh, put out by the Lydia E. Pinkham Company um, with tips on like housekeeping and cooking and things like that and completely chock full of, res uh, of ads for the vegetable compound sweets, fruits and candies, our wild, our wild neighbors. If you want me to open one of them and kind of look at a, um, some of the contents, I'm happy to do so. Just shout out which one you want me to open. But our wild neighbors is an interesting one. I might look at that one in a second. Come into the kitchen. How to be happy. Um, Chandra, I'm not sure. Ooh, uh, <laughs> Strawberryos, thank you for the follow. Um, I, I don't know if any of these have been scanned. I'm not sure the status of our culinary pamphlet collection. My guess would be no, because it's a rather large collection. Um, so probably not scanned here. It's possible that someplace else might have copies and might have them on the internet. Um, I'm not sure if Kira is here here at the moment, she could probably tell you for sure. Um, I can check and see if they happen to be on our site. D 
do, 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 do. That is if the site wants to load. Uh, Virginia Tech's entire website went down for about an hour earlier today. Um, so <laughs> I don't know what's going on with our internet stuff. Um, but our special collections online site seems to not be functional at the moment. So I can't even check to see if, if they are there scanned. Um, let me see, maybe our blog would say. Um, let's see. I could honestly actually show you what I'm looking at right now. This is not the place that I would uh, normally go to try and find out whether something was scanned, but um, I visited our digitalsc.lib.vt.edu site, which is our special collections online site where we put things after we've scanned them. Um, it's currently not functional. Uh, so I went over to our What's Cooking at Special Collections blog, which is the one that's focused on our history of food and drink collection. And I'm just looking, I did a search for Pinkham. Because I figure if they have been digitized, it will say so in this blog post. Um, apparently, I managed to get one of the lucky times of viewing it that an ad shows. So I don't see a mention on here of us having digitized them. So my guess is that we've not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I can definitely check with Kira and, and let you know, Chandra. Hi, Key Squared. I'm curious about this one, our wild neighbors. And then we'll, we'll look at something possibly older. Um, confidence. If Lydia E. Pinkham were alive today, she would be 114 years old. Hey, that'll give us a year as to when this pamphlet was, was published. Um, I don't know what year Lydia Pinkham was born, but I'm sure that information is available. Uh, her descendants still continue to manufacture her famous vegetable compound and other remedies, and the integrity of four generations is behind the products. You can buy these at any good drugstore. So we've got Lydia E. Pinkham's vegetable compound. We've got Lydia E. Pinkham's tablets. Uh, Lydia E. Pinkham's pills for constipation. Lydia E. Pinkham's sanative wash liquid form, and Lydia E. Pinkham's uh, tablets, it looks like, just in a different package. She was born in 1819, so 114 years would be, this would be 19, 1919 plus 14 more, 19, 1933, if I'm getting my math correct, and I have zero confidence that I'm getting that math correct, but somewhere around like the beginning of the 1930s uh, for when this pamphlet was put out. <gasps> I'm just, I... So this booklet is about animals. We have a description of the American Eagle, lions. Yes, 1933, woo, I did math in my head. Um, the ship of the desert, so talking about camels, cavorting kangaroo, 
porcupine, hedgehog, beavers, elephant. So like every other page is a write-up of about, or about an animal, um, and then every other page is an ad for a Lydia E. Pinkham medicinal product. This is a very kind of strange presentation. Do you, I guess you buy this for the information on the animals? So that you can, let's see, 1933 marketed towards women and housewives. I guess you buy it so that you can know about the animals to tell your kids about animals. I'm just trying to figure out why somebody would pick up this pamphlet. Um, so I'm guessing that the little information here about the animals uh, is intended to give you information that you can tell your kids about the animals of the natural world, and then you know every other page is an ad for the products. I'm gonna read the squirrel one just because we're here and squirrel girl, squirrel girl is amazing. Um, <laughs> so meet Mr. Nibbler. This graceful frisky squirrel belongs to the rodent or rat family. So do the rabbit, the mouse, and the hare. Rodents nibble or gnaw their food instead of biting it. All rodents have projecting front teeth. As constant gnawing wears the teeth away, they grow again so that they are always just the right length. There are few prettier sights in the animal world than a bright-eyed fluffy-tailed squirrel sitting on his haunches, daintily nibbling a toothsome nut held in his front paws. Nuts from the principal item of the squirrel's nuts form the principal item of the squirrel's diet, and early in the autumn the thrifty creatures may be seen storing nuts in convenient places for his winter's food supply. Eats nuts kicks butt. <laughs> The agile squirrel lives in a nest placed high in the fork of a tree. Although he has only leaves, grass, and moss with which to build, he combines them so cleverly that his house is snug and warm and dry. In his nest, he spends the night and the long winter months. Here he retires for a quiet nap on, a hot, su on hot summer afternoons. So yeah, they're just general descriptions of the animals. Um, so I think my theory as to why someone would pick up this particular pamphlet holds up uh, that as a mother and a housewife you would pick this up to just get general information on a variety of animals so that you could talk to your kids about those animals when they have questions about the animals and then uh, the reason why this medicine company put it out was because every other page is an ad for their medicines. Which is really interesting. But let's look at another one. We can always come back to these if, if you all want me to look at more of the, the Pinkham pamphlets. Uh, we can certainly do that. Uh, but I've been live for about a half hour, and I have many more things to show. Uh, so this one is just labeled Hertford Recipe Book, or sorry, Hertford Receipt Book. Um, let's see, MS 2008-27. Let me see what our finding aid says about it. Uh, I have too many screens to pay attention to. Give me one moment. Where is... Aha, here we go. <laughs> do, 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 do. I just have to get back to the search box real quick. And I'm gonna try and search and find this hopefully faster than the last one. Uh, I, P, T, book, got it. All right, let me switch over so you can see it. There we go. Is 
in the 1980s, Pioneer Seeds put out a children's book about the life cycle of, corn, of, of a corn seed to promote their company. That makes sense. Farmer Dan fills his tractor, glug, glug, glug. Farmer Dan fills his tractor with fuel. Still remember that first line to this day, thanks to your younger brother. Um, yeah, I, I find old advertisements really fascinating. Um, it's, it's something that I am very interested in. And um, while we don't have a focus on that, we have a lot of old advertisements in our collections. So I do get to spend some time looking at them. Um, so this is a handwritten book from Hertford, England, containing recipes for home remedies, household items, rat poison, cakes, breads, meats, stews, beverages, ales, and more. Uh, Hartford, England, a county in Hertfordshire from 1800 to 1833 is when it was written. Receipts or recipes were documented by several people as handwriting changes throughout the volume. Some recipes are ascribed or attributed and dated. Attributions include Miss Anne Morris, W.R. Price, Mrs. Whitmore, the Hartford paper, and Shrewsbury paper, among others. Recipes for home remedies and household necessities encompass a large portion of the manuscript, examples of which are a rec receipt for killing rats, a formula for common lead-colored paint, and a salve for drawing wounds. Edible recipes include jellies, cakes, breads, meats, stews, and beverages, ales, and wines. Cool. Let's go to our document focus and we will take a look and we'll see how hard this one is going to be for me to read uh <laughs> when a squirrel buries a nut it usually forgets yes um squirrels often forget where they have buried their nuts which uh can sometimes lead to new trees so not necessarily a bad thing, as long as they have other nuts that they can eat. Um, here we go. Here's the front. Uh, so, ra rather old. It looks like it had a label on it at one point. Um, and that you can sort of make out the word receipts. Um, receipts of trade... Wines? I, I don't know. Um, only part of the label is there, and those are just a couple of words there that you can see. Um, but they're kind of hard to make out. And it's um, a pretty typical, like, brownish colored ink. Um, uncertain whether it turns brown over time or whether it was actually brown ink. Uh, but a lot of older writing ends up having uh, like a brownish color to it um, when we look at it. Tends to turn brown over time. This hits your special interest today? That's, that's cool, Chandra. I'm glad. So I, I claim, I, I do not claim to be an expert on most of the things. My training is in describing materials and organizing materials. That is what an archivist does. Um, a historian might have a particular focus. Sometimes an archivist will focus in a specific area, but um, culinary history is definitely not my area of expertise when it comes to archives and archival materials. So, and most of these things um, when I share them on the stream, I've never seen them before. So you're encountering them for the first time at the same time I am, which is why a lot of times chat knows more about what I'm looking at than I do. Uh, they first store their nuts in their nests, and when they have no more room, they bury them. Um, Kira, I have not pulled out snail water yet, but since you're here, um, do you know if any of the uh, uh, Pinkham pamphlets have been digitized. Um, our Omeka site was not loading, so I was unable to check. So let's see, we have 
a recipe for making bread of ground corn, I think is what that is saying. You don't think so, but you'll have to check. May have used some in it. I, I saw what looked like two blog posts um, that mentioned Pinkham on the, the food history blog, um, but I didn't spend too much time digging. Uh, but Chandra was asking. So, take a quantity of. I do not know what this word is. A quantity of something and boil them in water. I mean, it's got to be something corn related, but I just can't make out what that word is. Yeah, it's a recipe for cornbread. Nettles, unground corn. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Old handwriting can sometimes flow and sometimes you stumble and, you know, reading, handwriting, when, when, what is the year on this one again? Reading um, handwriting from, let's see, 1800, live on the internet uh, for the first time, somewhat difficult. Kernels makes more sense than nettles does. Take a quantity of kernels and boil them in water. Uh, leaven your flour overnight with leaven mixed with thin water. In the morning, knead your dough likewise with it and bake it. So, not being a huge cooking person and adhering religiously to recipes when I do my baking, I'm not 100% certain what they would be asking you to use as leaven here. Um, this would have been from England, 1800. I'm not sure what the typical leaven would have been for that area at that time. Lower down it says nettle water. You leaven with salt. Interesting. Um, our correspondent observes it is astonishing what effect this nettle water has in raising the bread, whether made of wheat flour or mixed with barley. So yeah, it is nettles. It entirely removes the unwholesome quality of flour and as the herb is of a salutary tendency, must be an additional recommendation. Uh, 12 pounds of flour thus baked, we are told, will yield 17 pounds of good round bread. Something, journal June 1800. Recipes of the time, yeah, were more directions. Um, and you had to have a basic set of ideas. Nettle may have been a way of getting wild yeast. You don't leaven with salt. Homemade baking powder of sorts, cream of tartar maybe. Cool. Um, so that, that, I read it because it's the first one in this book, but I'm looking specifically for the medicinal ones. Let's see, we've got a, a Burberry jelly, a birch wine. We have a toothache cure, uh, toothache, cure four, uh, down here at the bottom. Uh, an equal quantity of flour, and pepper mixed together into a ball the size of a large uh, tea, moistened with any kind of spirit, and tied up in a bit of thin muslin, put into the ear on the side the diseased tooth is on, will relieve the pain. The ball should be kept wet if the tooth is hollow, nothing will sooner give ease than strong oil of cloves on cotton. Mrs. Uh, Colpoise, or something like that, I'm not sure. P, 
P-E-A. Size of a large P. Okay, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's interesting. Usually, and then Rogan gets to the clove oil bit. Uh, you, you were going to say usually they call for clove oil? <laughs> so flour and pepper, roll it into a ball, uh, moisten it with, a, with some spirit, and wrap it up in some muslin. Put it in the ear. Ball should be kept wet. And then they mention uh, clove oil. <laughs> Treatment of teeth. Too great an attention cannot be paid to the teeth of children between the age of 6 and 14. The utmost care is absolutely necessary at the time of changing uh, at the time of changing the teeth, for it is too for it too frequently happens that the oldest teeth by con by continuing too long force the young ones into a wrong direction, and that sometimes to such a degree as to cause the appearance of a double row, of a double row, uh, and this is truly unbecoming, and the timely assistance of a dentist should be called in to prevent or remove it. For if it is suffered to remain any length of time, it will not be in the in the, uh, it will not be in the power of the ablest artist to cure the deformity, and the person who is so unfortunate as to not have proper assistance at this critical period will be ever subject to all the inconvenience which proceeds from a bad set of teeth. It is almost un. Uh, it is almost unnecessary to add that where due attention has been paid to the teeth at an early age, and particularly at the time of shedding them, a very small degree of attention to cleaning is afterwards sufficient to preserve their. soundness and beauty to even er, uh, even to old age. Blair, dentist Chester, in the application of tooth powder there. <laughs> no, Picadle, that's fine. Um, I, I didn't think salt was a leavener, but how am I to know? I don't know things. I was asking because I didn't really rem remember exactly what would be leaveners, because uh, I don't think about I don't think about ingredients in that way. I just follow recipes. Um, so looking at older recipes, I have to actually start thinking about well, what function does this ingredient have in a recipe? And while I do a lot of baking, I n I don't normally think about what I'm baking in that way. Um, so old recipes are kind of good for making you kind of think through why certain things are in recipes. To make a cheap white paint for stains and bruises. Uh, more tooth powder. Ooh, one for consumption. Drink cold spring water sweetened with sugar and a teaspoonful of cream of tartar um, put into it. Uh, I can't make out this here. Half a pint morning and evening. But I... Colt's foot tea. Thank you, Chandra. <laughs> um... Yeah, I can try and zoom in a little bit. I don't want to go so far that they're off 
but I can go... That should hopefully be better. And if I, if I get stuck on something, I can zoom in a little bit further. Oh, sorry, zoom out. So you can see more of the page. Yes, sorry, I thought you were asking for in. <laughs> I have to push the buttons and then see how far it goes and then push the buttons and see how far it goes. So, because I have zoomed too far before. Um, is, is this better? I can go all the way out. I can also autofocus. So consumption, that's the one that we just looked at. That would be tuberculosis. Um, then we have whooping cough. Uh, an infusion of I'm not sure what that is. Some kind of root, an infusion of something root fresh and sweetened with honey is said to be an excellent remedy in the whooping cough. Miller. Elecampane root, what is that? I've never heard of such. Elecampane. Oh, it's a pretty yellow flower. Used, so I, I'm gonna show you this. Oh, hi, Alessa Ryder. <laughs> Thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed the stream. Um, screen share here. So I just, a quick Google search, uh, El Campaign. It's these, these yellow flowers, apparently. And it, the first result is WebMD. Um, also called horseheel or elf dock, is a widespread plant species in the sunflower family, native to Eurasia from Spain to Xinjiang province in western China naturalized in parts of North America, used for conditions such as asthma, bronchitis, intestinal worms, and many others, but there's no good scientific effort, uh, evidence to support those uses, apparently. Oh, and Chandra's got it in the, in the chat. Um. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Elf Doc sounds to me like a, a pretty cool itch. The last one on this page is itch. Um, uh, let's see. Decoction of elecampane root applied In turn, uh, no. Outwardly is said to cure the itch. <laughs> Not a lot of studies have been done on old. Um, I mean, a lot of, a lot of old patent medicines had stuff like turpentine in them. So, um, consumption, scab in sheep. British herb tobacco, nervous diseases. Uh, I'll I'll Alpha, uh, that's not alpha. I keep wanting to say alpha. I, I can't make out these words. Um, alpha foctida? It, hel it, it helps if they're words I know. I do not know these words. Can anybody make out what 
what these first two words are under nervous diseases. I'm gonna try Googling. Because sometimes if I get close, um, asafetida, A-S-A-F-O-E-T-I-D-A, Yep, that looks like what it probably is, which is a... herb. Spice. <laughs> yeah, so it looks like it's asafetida, um, A-S-A-F-O-E-T-I-D-A, -E which is apparently... Uh, A spice from southern Iran. Uh, anyway, is commonly used in hysteria and hypochondria. Some symptoms of dyspepsia, flatulent colics, and most sinuses. Oh no, most diseases termed reason, termed reasons. No, most, nope, don't know what that word is. It looks like it should be diseases, but it doesn't make sense if it is. Anyway, thought to be the most powerful remedy Uh, something for those peculiar convulsions and spasmodic afflictions, which often appear in hysterics. I don't think it says appear, but I'm not that worried about it. It's, it's something along those lines. It's recommended as an... Amenagogic Anyway, <laughs> recur, thank you. Most diseases turned nervous. You're doing much better with this handwriting than I am, Chandra. <laughs> Let's see, uh, dyspeptic complaints. Remedy for worms. Diarrheas and hemorrhages. I'm going to read some titles. If you want me to read one of the recipes, let me know. Wounds and hemorrhages, worms. Then we have one that's just titled tapioca. A bit more practice with Victorian hand. Uh, used to work at a living history museum. Focused on that time um, as a cause. Yes, I. I think I knew that. I didn't realize that that involved a lot of reading Victorian handwriting. I'm strangely more practiced with like American Civil War era handwriting, um, which has a, a lot more slant to it than this actually has. Um, these aren't too bad. It's just when I'm reading online and trying to read out loud, like live on the internet, I stumble over words sometimes and I'm just like, I panic if I get to one that's gonna take me a second to make out. <laughs> um, ulcers of the mouth. The bark and resin of... Um, croton des... Deciferum? Or lycroton? I don't know what those are, is recommended for ulcers in the mouth. Uh, and resin is commonly called gum lye. Like, it seems like they're using scientific names for things. 
but basically chewing on this uh, resin from this particular plant for ulcers of the mouth. Um, dysentery, poison, ulcers and wounds, worms, rheumatic fever, hemorrhoids, epilepsies and convulsions, banyan tree, is that, is that what it says? Also used to create shellac. Oh, it doesn't actually say banyan on the page, though. Croton laciferum. But that's the, that's the banyan tree. Yeah, it looked like it was a scientific name, which throwing in things like that makes it doubly hard to actually read what it says. Let's see. Poison. The berries of... Mezeron? Me or... Wow, I can't even make out what that is. It's literally a recipe for poison. I thought it was going to be to, like, cure poison, but it's a recipe to make poison. <laughs> So I guess it's a good thing I can't make out what it says. <laughs> uh, Miserium berries? I don't know that that's what it is. It's a bright red berry, though. Four-lobed pink or purple. It does look like the red berries that I... Yeah, yeah, it is toxic. Uh, M-E-Z-E-R-E-U-M. -E -E Daphne Miserium. The berries of Miserium, or Daphne Miserium, form a powerful poison not only to man, but to many quadrupeds. <laughs> yeah. It's just, we're in here looking at cures, and so I was expecting something to to help cure poisoning, I wasn't expecting a recipe for poison. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> kind of jumped out at me there. Uh, ulcers, dropsy, Red gum tree. A cure for warts. Um, so Daphne Miserum, or Miserium, very toxic because of the compounds Mezarin and Daphnin present, present especially in the berries and twigs. If poisoned victims experience a choking sensation, handling the fresh twigs can cause rashes and eczema in sensitive individuals. Despite this, it is commonly grown as an ornamental plant in gardens for its attractive flowers. Um, so yeah, not, not arsenic like with apples. It's, it's mezarin and daphnin. Uh, mezarin's a toxic diterpene ester. And daphnin is a plant toxin. That's, that's interesting. Um, but it's the, the little decorative bushes. They have pink flowers, and then they have these small, small red um, berries on them that are in kind of clusters. And um, they're just really attractive. They look really delicious when you're a child. And I, I remember being told, don't eat those, they're poisonous. 
Um, and the birds eat them just fine, but that those berries were poisonous. Um, and I never knew what they were called until today. <laughs> So we have a cure for warts. The juice of spurge is dropped on warts or corns to remove them. The juice of spurge. Yeah, kind of like holly. They, they do look similar to holly, but they're not, uh, they don't have the, the same leaves. Oh, probably spurge weed. There's a weed called spurge. So I would guess the juice of the spurge weed is what is being referenced here. Let's see. Violent purging. Rheumatism. We've definitely changed handwriting. It did note that there were multiple different people. Um, receipt for making blacking. I don't know, Picadal. Chandra might know, but I don't. What is this? It doesn't say what this one is for, but I'm going to read it. Um, it is said that the French, since they have been prevented from importing colonial produce, have discovered a substitute for coffee in the roots of the wild endive. Um, it's underlined and somebody has written chicory or what is most generally called dandelion. I wonder when that was added because it's a much more, I don't know, it's purple ink, which gardening isn't your focus, that's fine. So I, I don't know how more, how much, how recently somebody underlined the word endive, uh, and wrote in chicory, but it was done in purple ink. It's still in a cursive. Uh, it's saying the roots of endive. Or, uh, but then it goes on to say, or what is most generally called dandelion. And on Andive and Dandelion are not the same at all, so <laughs> don't know about that one. Bran bread. Uh, Godbold's recipe for a cough. For a burn or skull. Yeah, Dandelion tea is a thing. This was talking about um, the roots of a plant being used for coffee or a coffee replacement, which chicory makes sense, but it's not. Um, no, not graham bread, bran bread. Snakes don't go where geraniums grow. I have not heard that one before. Cleaning boot tops. A salve for drawing wounds. Wait, endive root is chicory? Interesting. I still don't know why they would say that it's a plant more commonly referred to as dandelions because endive and dandelions are not the same thing, are they?
Interesting. Known in Italy as Catalona Frastag Frastagliata, Italian dandelion chicory seeds produce not a dandelion but a chicory, a kind of endive or endive. So it is, and it, it's an Italian dandelion, not like the little dandelion flower that we think of um, that was actually spread in the U.S. on purpose as a foodstuff. <laughs> yeah, this is really, really interesting. Yeah, I can't make out this handwriting at all. A salve for drawing wounds. Take of something or common horse turpentine. Common resin, such as is used by player on the violin. And a small quantity of Red precipitate and boil them together pumice. Thank you. Take of pumice or common horse turpentine, common resin, such as is used by player on the violin and a small quantity of red precipitate and boil them together or or something put, put the precipitate in after or rather put the precipitate in after uh, a little burnt alum may be thrown into a wound to clean it, but a very small quantity has a good effect. Interesting. Yeah, you can make wine from dandelion flowers. You can eat dandelions um, in salads. Like they were intentionally planted in the US um, and encouraged to grow because they are easy to grow and they're a foodstuff. Um, you wouldn't want to do it today unless you knew that they had been grown without any sort of chemicals or pesticides or stuff like that. Um, but they are and a very, very edible plant. Um, and so there are a lot of recipes for dandelions. See if you're a cough, cure of bile. Yeah, this is definitely a different person writing these now. This handwriting has changed drastically. Receipt for making blacking, receipt for cancer. Alum has so many uses, I can use it to boil out a broken drill bit in jewelry. Interesting. Yeah, dandelions grow wild um, kind of everywhere. It was originally brought over to, to be planted so that people could have it as food. Um, but then everybody decided it was a weed <laughs> and worked to get rid of it. But it, yeah, it just basically grows wild. Um, I don't know of anywhere that it's actually cultivated, but you wouldn't want to like pick it from somebody's yard unless you knew kind of how they had been maintaining their yard. Because a lot of yard chemicals, a lot of weed killers, um, are not things that you particularly want to eat. Receipt for cancer. And I would love to read it, but I am getting, I'm getting basically nothing from this handwriting. Um,
a late member of the Gentleman's Magazine gives an account of some curious and well-authenticated facts relating to the use of use of I'm not sure olives something commonly called Fungrap? Scientifically, Gallium Aparinae. Cloves? Cloves, maybe. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can find out. They gave a scientific name. Gallium Cleavers. It's Gallium Aparinae, uh, G-A-L-I-U-M-A-P-A-R-I-N-E, with common names including cleavers, clivers, catchweed, and sticky willy, among others. An annual herbaceous plant of the Ru Rubiaceae. Sorry. Uh, anyway, we'll just call it sticky willy. <laughs> uh, Gallium aparinae, uh, in the cure of what most, or, uh, in the cure of that most terrible malady, the cancer. The process was recommended by a clergyman in the county to a poor woman who had for some years been, uh, afflicted with a bloody cancer and who was then thought to be in so hopeless a state as to have but a short time to live after giving her an uh, operant medicine advising her to abstain from salt meat and to live on most simple diet, he advised her to take twice a day greater of a pint of the juice of cleavers, clivers, the plant having been well founded and Pardon me. Uh, well founded and queried. He advised that the, or he advised that she, no, the, I don't know, that the juice should also be boiled and mixed with hog's lard for an ointment to the wound, saying the bruised cliver, oh, laying the bruised clivers over it and <coughs> keeping them constantly applied and renewed. <laughs> Still put Fourth is a detoxifying agent for cancer. Interesting. <laughs> uh, the something to be. I can't make out this sentence, but so very gradual that it requires study perseverance in the use both of the internal and external huh so I not really able to make out everything if I spent a lot of time and, and 
really worked at it. I probably could make out the rest of this recipe, but um, this was from November 1814 and apparently is a plant that is still used for skin irritation relating to, okay. Wait, no, it can cause skin irritation. Goosegrass, coachweed, catchweed, sticky willy. Used widely by modern herbalists. <clears throat> Valuable diuretic, often taken to treat skin problems such as seboria, eczema, and psoriasis and as a general detoxifying agent in serious illnesses such as cancer. So used by herbalists, not necessarily by medical professionals. So just a note there that you do want to consult a medical professional before, <laughs> before relying on it for medical treatments, I would say. Uh, but after cancer, we have recipes for paint. Bateman's drops. Yes, don't try this at home, please. <laughs> Apple wine. Hydrophobia. Breakfast rolls, French bread. <laughs> Some pudding, cheese biscuits for dessert. Tea cakes. I think we've gotten into some actual like food recipes now instead of medicinal recipes. Spanish puffs. Uh, let me see if I can find where those were and I will read it. Tea cakes, Spanish puffs. I will try to read it. Um, the paper's somewhat thin, the ink was pretty heavy, and so I've got, in trying to read this, I've got the actual ink on this side, but also um, the ink is showing through from the other side of the page, which makes it even harder to read. So I'm going to try and lean forward a little bit this time. <laughs> oh, you've got it? Uh, a pint of new milk. Set it over the fire and stir as much fine flour into it as will make it thick as paste when it has boiled a little while. Put it into a wooden bowl and beat it on, uh, beat it an hour with a wooden pestle. When beaten, put in four eggs, one at a time, Sweeten it to your taste with fine sugar. You must have a pan of boiling lard and drop them in bits the size of a walnut. Let them fry till done. The rind of a lemon much improves them. This is our price. They sound like donut holes. <laughs> yeah, pretty simple. Yeah, they're, they're it's basically donut holes. <laughs> I had not heard of Spanish puffs. Apple pudding, white fish sauce. Yeah, we've definitely gotten to the food section. Spanish pancakes, to dry cherries, striped lute string. Okay, sorry, I have to find out what striped lute string is referring to. And then we're gonna look at snail water. Before, before today's done, we're gonna look at snail water. If we get to nothing else in that book today, we're gonna look at snail water. Um, it's not in this book, it's in a different book. Striped lute, 
loot string. Uh, take some lean bacon, boil it and boil it and I have no idea what this word is. What about pickled walnuts and pigeons? I think you, well, we'll jump straight to snail water. It looks like bruise, but bruising bacon? That's not something I've ever heard of before, so it stumped me. But it does look like bruise. Boil it and bruise it in a mortar. I mean, okay, in a mortar. Bruise makes sense. Uh, and put some put some oiled butter to it. Beat it till it is like some <laughs> Does this really say beat it till it is like some meat thing? <laughs> is that what it says? That's what it looks like. Take it out. Having made your mortar quite clean, take veal, rabbit, or chicken and beat it in the same way with the addition of a little leavening. Then lay it on a potting pot, first a layer of veal, then a layer, no, first a layer of red, then a layer of white. Let it stand a day or two with a weight on it. Then pour on clarified butter, cut it out in slices, and send it to table. Mrs. R. Price. Force meat. Beat it till it is like force meat? Then take it out. I'm not familiar with force meat. Basically the inside of a hot dog consistency. Oh, okay, thank you. So it's called striped loot string and it seems like it is a layered uh, meat thing where you pound up the meat and layer it with different types of meat uh, and butter. So you get a, essentially a square of processed meat. Uh, and it doesn't seem like you, other than boiling it, you don't cook it. So it's boiled meat that's mashed up and then layered into essentially a layer cake of meat. You're making striped spam. Okay. Also called a farce. Interesting. So this was called striped loot string, uh, which I had to stop and find out what that was. Marlboro cake. Cranberry tarts. Gooseberry biscuits. Green gooseberry wine, lemon cream. Oh, we have another hand, just for a couple of recipes. Fortifying beer. Uh, pickle for pork or beef. Oh, Kira, I'm sorry you were going to miss snail water. We can look at it again next week if you want. Um, Because snail water is a short recipe and it's kind of fun. It was on the tweet. Let's see. Rheumatism, stone and gravel. We can always come back to some of these too. Ointment of nitrate of mercury. I really want to know who's commenting in purple ink. They said, damn it, exclamation point.
Like, I'm... The handwriting is really kind of similar, but much thinner. And so I don't know if it's a modern hand or if it's commentary that was at the time. I feel like with purple ink, it's more likely to have been modern, but I don't know. And then we've got completely different hand. I don't think it's a ballpoint pen. Let me, it's, so here under ointment of nitrate of mercury, the word damn it there. Whoops, I zoomed in really, really close for you there. One second, let me zoom out a little bit. That's what happens when I hold the button too long. It could be, like the quality of it, the handwriting is really kind of similar to the handwriting throughout. Um, but it's just commentary on it and I can't, yeah, it does feel kind of like a fountain pen. It doesn't seem like a ballpoint. It's just weird that it's purple. Um, like it's a pale lavender color and everything else is done in the black ink. <laughs> Obviously, after the hazards of Mercury came out. Yeah, I mean, true, I, I can read this one and, and we can very much comment that we should not do this. Um, Take a purified, take a purified quicksilver an ounce uh, nitric acid, 11 drams prepared lard, six ounces olive oil, four ounces while it is hot with the lard and oil melted together. It may be bought in the shops ready mixed. This is an invaluable com composition it is stimulant and cleaning and is used with the greatest advantage in sealed head. And other, nope, can't, that doesn't make sense. and other something uh, on that part in chronic inflammation of the eye and specks on the cornea and in ulcers in such caves it in such cases it stimulates the part to a healthy action and will often cure very obstinate samples of the different afflictions after other powerful remedies have failed. Uh, we sadly lose a little bit of it because the bottom of the page has worn away over time. Um, yeah, don't. Don't take Quicksilver in any mixtures, uh, especially not with nitric acid and lard, quicksilver being mercury, um, is extremely poisonous. <laughs> and mercury with nitric acid and lard does not seem like a curative. <laughs> okay, we're gonna look at snail water. We can always come back to the Hartford res uh, receipt book. Um, we definitely haven't read everything that's in there. But, we have the Book for Receipts 1731 um, that we're going to look at next. It <laughs> looks alarmed at historical understandings of biochemistry. Yes, indeed. So, the Book for Receipts 1731. Receipt book. 1731. Yeah, lead... 
lead was used very commonly in paints too, but a lot of makeups um, and, and other like face creams and things like that used lead. And then mercury, ingestion of mercury was used for a lot of home remedies. Let's see, book of, of receipts. Nope, wow. O-F. Yes, that is what I meant to search. Please. Do I not have 2008-24, please? One moment. I have typed poorly. MS 2008-024. Huzzah! I have found it. Um, so this book is a recipe book written in England in 1731. At least two authors' names unknown. Uh, re recipes focus largely on delicacies, not on staple meals, uh, and on home remedies. Uh, names of the owners remain un unknown because the handwriting changes in the last third. We know that there were two authors. Some recipe contributors are named, such as Lady Westmoreland, Mrs. Catherine Sanderson, Mrs. Alston, Mrs. Gilbert, and uh, Senor Orlando Guise. Or Sir Orlando Guise, sorry. Uh, one noteworthy, it says one noteworthy, one noteworthy example of a home remedy entitled The Famous American Receipt for Rheumatism appears in the volume, but I have yet to find it because I was looking through this book. Uh, this is the book that I used to get an image for like the, the tweet for today. And I had read this and I tried finding the, the Famous American Receipt for Rheumatism and I have yet to find it. According to the author, is very famous in America. A hundred pounds have been given for the receipt. So they paid a hundred pounds to get the recipe. Recipes also indicate the availability of foodstuff in the 18th century as seen through the use of several pounds of good Jamaican sugar. So if you happen to see a recipe for the famous American receipt for the rheumatism, make sure to scream at me because I haven't been able to find that one yet. Um, I have no idea, Picadal, whether they still use burn motor oil for lipstick. So, we start in this volume with pickles and preserves, um, but we will return to them because we're going to find the snail water first. But I'm going to turn the pages um, one at a time because they are somewhat fragile. This volume actually gets fairly regular use in our instructional sessions. Um, I'm not 100% certain why it was selected, but I would imagine it has something to do with the very illuminated handwriting. Um, it's very simple handwriting, the recipes are interesting, and it's not too difficult to actually make out what's written, but it's all very visually appealing, so I would guess that that's probably why it gets picked for some of the um, instructional sessions that we do. Um, but yeah, we will definitely want to look at the pickling because there's a lot of pickling. Um, I don't want to lose this. There's a piece of string that has come out um, from the string that used to bind these pages together. But I'm just trying to get to the snail water because I want to do the snail water today. And we can definitely start with this one next week. And I have a lot more. Um, let's see, we've got cakes and biscuits. I don't want to be bending the pages too much. Almond candy. 
to make make rooms. I don't know what make rooms are. Cakes, Grange cake. Candied Angelica, yeah. We will, we'll go back to that one in a minute. I'm gonna find the snail water real quick. <laughs> no, uh, I'm, I'm happy that you're enjoying it and that you're shouting things out. Um, syrups, elder wine. I think that's as far out as this will zoom. I can try and go a little bit higher so maybe you can see both pages. This document camera was not intended to show two pages at once. It, it's really intended to show an eight and a half by 11 page. Here we go. We've got, we've reached the, the page with the snail water on it. So in here we have gooseberry wine, small mead, surfeit water, snail water, and cinnamon water on these pages. And we're going to start with the snail water. And I will attempt to read it. Take six pound of, actually, hang on. I have, a, I have something that will help me with this. Um, because I think, in fact, I know that this is mentioned in the blog. Uh, so, uh, somebody else has already figured out what it says. Um, I don't know if the entire recipe is repeated here, but I'm going to check and see. Yes, okay. Take six pounds of garden snails, wash them well, and drain them in a colander, and dry them with a cloth, and then bruise them. Uh, shells and snails together, take two handfuls of ale hoof, roots of marshmallows, and licorice of each a quarter of a pound, half a handful of rosemary, 16 eggs beaten with shells, uh, whites and yolks, and all together half an ounce of nutmegs, put, the, put to these one gallon of new milk, then distill it gently. Yes, six pounds of snails, garden snails, 16 eggs, Shells, whites, and yolks together. <laughs> so, uh, I, I know a little bit about it because Kira did, um, she has a blog post about it. Uh, let's see. I wondered what would actually cause someone to ingest this mixture, she says in her blog. A little research later, it turns out snail water was a common treatment for consumption, tuberculosis, during the 17th and 18th centuries. Recipes varied greatly. At least one included ground up earthworms in addition to snails, as well as various combinations of herbs, but none proved to be a miracle cure. <laughs> we invite you to view our recipe, though I wouldn't suggest trying it before you accuse me of cruelty to snails. The 1731 Book for Receipts is available online in PDF on our website. Um, recipe for, sh for snail waters on page 23, but the whole item is worth a look. So yeah, actually this entire book is on our um, website that I would drop into the chat, except it does not seem to want to work today. Um, so I don't know why website is down. Hopefully next week it will be working and I can put the link in chat. Um, yes, you distill it. So you're not actually going to have the snail shells and the egg shells. 
in what you drink because you're going to distill it, so it's just going to be the liquid, but it is still a very odd concoction. Uh, and surfeit water. I have, there's a S-U-R-F, F-E-I-T? Nope. I thought there was a mention in here of what that was for, but I don't seem to see it. Anyway, surfeit water. I don't know what surfeit water is for. Oh yes, uh, surfeit water is for indigestion. It's like if you've eaten too much, use surfeit water. That's what surfeit water is for. So the, the recipe just above the snail water is surfeit water. Um, Take four handfuls of Cardus Benedictus, uh, pick one from your stock, three great handfuls of spearmint, and three great handfuls of wormwood picked, mingle all these together well, then let them steep all night in six or seven quarts of milk according to discretion. Press your herbs hard down that your milk may be above, wait. I, I, I love the, the, the writing here. It's hard for me to tell exactly which words they mean sometimes. Um, press your herbs hard down that your milk may be above you Still, still your milk with a quick fire? I don't understand these instructions. In a coal still, that your milk may not lower? And afterwards, draw it with a gentle Pleat, pleat, I'm uncertain if, if that is the right word, as you distill other herbs, it will be four days and one night in distilling this, oh, this is good against all flavorish distempers and unnatural heats, and also against all surfeits of meals and drinks. Oh my gosh. I missed that follow. It was an hour ago. Tater thought, if you're still here, thank you for the follow. Um, that's weird. I don't know what Cardus Benedictus is. Let's see what ingredient is in this. Cardus benedictus is a thistle-like plant in the family Asteraceae, native to the Mediterranean region. Huh. Okay. So it's a like a thistle. <laughs> You're there working. Well, thank you for the follow an hour ago. I just noticed it. <laughs> I get I get caught up in trying to read 
uh, these old documents and then sometimes miss when people are following during the program. Um, let's see what cinnamon water is. Maybe cinnamon water will be more appealing than the surfeit water or the snail water. Snail water, quite entertaining to read though. Also just very interesting. So the way this handwriting is done, when they have a word like your, Y-O-U-R, um, as in like belonging to you, they're writing the letter Y and then there's like squiggles up above it, kind of like um, if you were taking a number and putting it to the power of another number in, in writing mathematics, they're taking the letter Y and then there are some squiggles up above it as though it was raised to the power of these squiggles. Uh, rather than writing the word your, and it's really confusing. <laughs> it's very clear in some cases that that's the word that is meant, but then in, then in other cases where it doesn't seem like quite the right word, um, I hesitate. Scribal notation. I have, I have not, um, th that is not an area, like so much of the history that I end up dealing with myself, like the, the kind of specialization of my historical area within the archives, doesn't really come about until like the 1960s <laughs> because I deal with a lot of LGBTQ plus history, um, civil rights era, and like early computers. Like those are the areas that I know the most about. So things like scribal notation, not really my forte. That is really interesting. It's an R. <laughs> no. Chandra, I love it. Thank you so much for knowing what it was called and for being able to describe it. I was, I really have never encountered it before this book. Um, and so the fact that I was able to figure out that they meant like the word your, um, I'm very proud of, my, uh, of myself for figuring that out in a first reading of it, but also I'd never seen it before. Okay, I'm going to read Cinnamon Water, or I'm going to try to. I really love, it's really, really pretty handwriting. Um, take two quarts of your best brandy, put it into a stone pot, uh, glazed, then take three pints of spring water and one pound of fine sugar. Boil it in... Oh, boil it and... Scour it clean and pour it pour it S E A T I N G Pour it something hot to your B R A N A Y or brandy. Pour it. I, I'm not. I'm not sure what that word is. Anyway, pour it hot into your brandy and put half a dram of your best chemical cinnamon and put a little sugar to your site, C-Y-T-E. I'm not sure about that word either. Uh, it will make it mix It will make it mix your, your better hmm. 
Hmm. Stir it well above and let it stand. Close stopped up three or four days, then strain it in a paper funnel or flannel and bottle it up. Common in the Middle Ages and tapers off after colonial times, so nearing the end of its common usage. Cool. So a lot of brandy and sugar and just a little bit of chemical cinnamon, spelled C-H-I-M-I-C-A-L, um, but spellings were not standardized in 1731. So definitely chemical cinnamon is what it means, it's just spelled differently. Um, Interesting. Let's see. Do I have anything picturey? I have lots of things. We literally looked at three things today, and there we barely touched this third one. Um, we will definitely be doing this again next week, and. Based on the progress and how interesting this is, we may just do this all month. I only have one shelf's worth. Like, you can see, this is, this is what I pulled. Here, I can, I can switch so you can see the bigger view. Um, this cart, just the top shelf of this cart, that's all I pulled. But we've only looked at two and uh, a page, two and a page, um, of these items today. So I, th I think we're just going to keep going with it. Um, and if we get to a point where we feel like we've gone through everything on the shelf, then I'll come up with something else for the next week. Uh, but my guess is that we can we can stay on this topic all month. And then in September, I'm probably going to go with something NASA related in September. Um, Depending. There's some early uh, early computers stuff that I would love to feature, but it hasn't been processed yet, and I would really like to process it and describe it before sharing it on the program um, so that we've got a finding aid and stuff like that. So I may try to process it this month and um, so that we can look at it in September. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but we'll be sticking with home remedies and um, folk medicine and patent medicines for next week, absolutely for sure. Um, but yeah, thank you all for coming by. We're going to be ending the program. We will be rating. Uh, let me just check and see. Um, so as usual, we, we are going to head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They do have the moon jelly cam today. So just a warning that there will be jellyfish when we arrive, um, in case that's not your jam. Uh, but thank you all for coming by. I will be live again next week at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27 for another archival adventures where we will continue um, starting with this book of receipts from 1731, um, exploring um, folk medicine and uh, patent medicines and um, just kind of just old medicine stuff. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming. No, no, Chandra, don't apologize. I Having your commentary has been very helpful. Um, having people commenting is definitely a part of having a Twitch stream. Um, and I pulled these knowing that I might be covering this for an entire week. So, or I mean an, an entire month. Um, so I'm absolutely, absolutely happy. Uh, that you commented. I hope you can come next week and, and enjoy them with us again. Um, but yeah, so that is going to be where we're going to call it for today. We are going to head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, enjoy the jellyfish cam, and I will see you next week 
2.30 p.m. Eastern Time right here for more uh, historic medicine. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming by.